So I wanted to start by thanking BBRF, of course, for supporting my research over and over and over again. You guys were always the first ones to think stem cells might be useful in the, the study of psychiatry, and, and hopefully not the last ones. I, you know, I, I keep trying to grow this, this idea and this platform, and I look forward to sharing with you today what your early funds have allowed us to do in the lab. And so I'm going to talk to you today about modeling schizophrenia, studying schizophrenia using stem cells. And I don't have to explain to any of you that schizophrenia is far too common and far too severe um, and far too poorly treated. Um, but why I, as a stem cell biologist, think that I can maybe help is this fact here, the estimates of heritability. Do I have a pointer? I do. So the estimates of heritability have ranged from 50 to 85 percent, but the latest twin studies from the newest data suggest it's closer to 80 percent. So this disease is, in, is hugely genetic and largely predisposed by the DNA that you're born with. And what I really think that means is that we can do a lot better job predicting this disease before symptom onset, treating this disease before symptom onset. And we just have to better understand what the genetic risk factors for this disease are, how they're interacting, um, and how they, they predispose you to uh, disease course, and, and hopefully drug treatment response. And so what I'm really challenging us to think about as a field is what if we switch from a diagnosis-based to a genotype-first treatment approach? What if it doesn't matter whether you have schizophrenia or bipolar? It matters that you have a specific mutation in a specific gene. What if we were to start in the clinic with a blood test to genotype the patients, and we could give them drugs after that? Um, and so this really hinges, to begin with, with a simple question that I asked when I started my postdoc uh, almost 10, uh, 10 years ago now. And, and so the question was, could we make human neurons from living schizophrenia patients in the lab? So while they were alive and walking around and enjoying their lives, I wanted from patients and controls to have neurons in the lab that I could do anything I wanted to. And so this is how we've been doing it. We take skin samples from patients and controls. Uh, we grow them as fibroblasts, turn those into induced pluripotent stem cells. And these cells are incredible. They can make every cell type in your body. So they can make all of the neurons and all of the astrocytes that are in the brain of each and any one of us. And they're identical to the cells in the brain of each and every one of us. And then we do a two-stage differentiation. First to immature neural cells and then to neurons. And this is what it looks like. So these are the stem cells. This is from one control in one patient. These are the neural progenitor cells, the immature neurons, and these are the neurons. These neurons fire action potentials. They have synaptic activity. They're real, live neurons. And I like to show this slide, even though the pictures are really old, because it reminds me to point out one important thing. The neurons from the patients look a lot like the neurons from the controls. This is what you would expect. Patients walk and talk and breathe like the rest of us. If it was so simple that I just couldn't make neurons from patients or they died overnight, there would be something wrong with my model. And so I think it's really encouraging that the cells look so similar. Now this was an outlandish idea when we started. Uh, schizophrenia is a brain disease. It's a human patient person specific disease because you really see it in a laboratory dish. And if you could, what sort of things would we be looking for? And so a lot of our early work was to repeat stuff that we already knew from 50 years of clinical research. What do we already know about schizophrenia? Well, we know the neurons tend to be a little bit smaller in the postmortem brains of patients versus controls. And that's mostly, it's entirely because, it's not because neurons are dying, it's because neurons are smaller. They have fewer dendrites, fewer connections, and fewer synapses between the neurons. So each neuron seems a little bit smaller. This is actually exactly what we saw in our first study in the lab. So this is only four patients in six controls, uh, but we saw fewer connections between the neurons. And what was really nice was that a couple years later, a second group on a completely independent cohort, these are three Israeli patients and, and three controls, found the exact same phenotype by the exact same assay. And so this is the first bicontinental replication of a stem cell phenotype, and, and we think it really justifies using stem cells to explore schizophrenia. A few years later, we were able to show that not just did these neurons have fewer connections between them, but those connections were less active. And so these traces show you all of the synaptic activity in a specific neuron that's being recorded. And there's fewer synaptic uh, inputs on the patient neurons. 
And so with that being said, we felt like we had a model. We were capturing some of the biology of schizophrenia risk, how the cells were um, celatonously different between patients and controls. And we want to use that to explore two questions. Can we better understand in human neurons how schizophrenia risk factors impact neurons? And, and second, can we use that to find new drugs to improve those neurons and make them go back to looking like the controls? And so uh, when I started my postdoc, there were no known schizophrenia genes that we still think today are, are associated by common variant studies. But uh, by 2014, there are 108. This year, there's a, two, 145. And next year, there'll be 252. And so there is a growing number of loci in the genome that are linked to schizophrenia. And the question then is, for each spot in the genome linked to schizophrenia, which genes or genes is it impacting? And how does that result in disease? And then that's really important because, again, it will allow us to better diagnose disease from blood draws and hopefully better predict treatment response. And so I want to talk to you about work asking two simple questions. Does changing genotype change gene expression? So if this risk loci is close to a nearby gene, was it actually regulating the gene? Like, we think it is, but somebody's got to test it, right? And second, if we just directly change the expression of a gene that we think is linked to schizophrenia risk in human neurons, does it change the function of human neurons? And so this is work led uh, highly by a, a postdoc in my lab, Nadine Schrode, and she took one common variant SNP, one single base pair. So we've talked about how there are six billion base pairs in the human genome. She took one that wasn't even in the middle of a gene, it was downstream of a gene, and she added just that one base pair, and she asked what it did. And so here's an example. She's taken this AA SNP to a GG status in iPS cells um, near the gene furin. And what she's been able to show after about two and a half years of solid effort is that in the stem cells, changing that AA to GG doesn't change expression. But that's okay. This is not a disease of stem cells. This is a disease of neurons. When she turns those stem cells into neurons, whether they're young neurons or old neurons, now changing that one SNP that's close but not inside a single gene changes expression of that gene by about 30%. So as I said, all of us have a handful or a dozen or two of these common variants, and we've never been able to show that they actually on their own matter. And she's showing that changing it has a 30% effect, which was much larger than we thought going in. Um, for many of those other risk variants, it's hard to tell which single one it is, because there's a few of them that are stuck together really in close proximity. And so we can cheat. And rather than changing the genotype to change expression, we can just change expression and see what happens. And so this is work done by a former grad student of mine, Suk Men Ho, and he's changing the expression of four genes that are uh, linked to schizophrenia. Here's an example from one of them, SNAP91. Now when we change this one gene, SNAP91 up or down, and then look at all the genes in the genome, we can see that uh, when we upregulate SNAP91, it's the only thing that changes, but when we downregulate it, lots of things change. And we can also look at neurons. It's again looking at that synaptic activity. How often is a neuron being stimulated by its neighboring neurons? And when we upregulate SNAP91, it gets stimulated more. When we downregulate it, neurons get stimulated less. And so this is really exciting. We are linking a variant to synaptic activity in human neurons, which I think is helping us slowly understand how these common variants lead to disease. And so really, when I started this work 10 years ago, I thought that it was about doing case control comparisons, about getting as many patients as we could and as many controls as we could and trying to understand how patient neurons were different from controls. But this, and, and this was really, um, we picked this strategy because we didn't know that much about genetics. And so we knew that even if we didn't know which genetic risk factors a given patient had, it had to be in the study because we took their skin. So everything that they carried was just going to be there by, by default. Um, and I liked it because unlike mouse models, this allowed us to ask questions about genetic background and penetrance. Why would two patients with the exact same risk factor have one have a disease and one not, or one have schizophrenia and bipolar? Why were risk factors having different effects in different people? Uh, the problem that we encountered was that the effect sizes were really small. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that, and it's not going to surprise you, every patient's different. But not only is every patient different, every control is different too. And I think we completely underestimated how different each and every one of us are. We see that in the lab in all of our experiments. And so we've started doing this um, a bit more cleverly. 
And so now we incorporate a new technology called CRISPR editing, where we change the DNA of any given person and then re ask the experiment. So I can take that schizophrenia risk factor and I can put it in this control or this control or even this patient and ask how changing one genetic risk factor impacts neural function across different people. And so by doing these isogenic comparisons, we're able to ask how changing genetic risk factors, if you change nothing else, all other things being constant, impact the cells. And so now our small effect sizes are balanced by the fact that there's much less noise in the system because you're asking it on the same background. And that heterogeneity between patients and controls uh, now allows us to retain the ability to capture effects of genetic background and penetrance. So I think we have a much more powerful platform by integrating our case control cohorts with genetic uh, editing. And with the last minute or two that I have, I want to talk to you about drug screening because that's what matters most of all. It's great if we can diagnose patients faster and younger, but it's much greater if we can treat them more specifically and more accurately. And so we've been trying to understand how to better do drug studies. Drug studies are really hard and they're really expensive. And when you're looking for completely new mechanisms of disease, you have to screen hundreds of thousands of drugs. Um, I can't do that in my small lab, but what I can do is work with some of the best bioinformaticians around to screen hundreds of thousands of drugs in silico in the computer. And so that's what we did with Joel Dudley at, at Mount Sinai. So Joel has mined all the data that all scientists around the world make publicly available. And he started with making disease signatures. So if one lab in Europe publishes uh, a study comparing gene expression in skin cells from uh, Alzheimer's patients and controls, and a lab in the US publishes with postmortem brain from schizophrenia patients and control, and somebody else publishes with tumor samples from cancer patients and controls, he just collects all the signatures for all the diseases and makes disease gene expression signatures. And then he does the same thing for drug treatment. He doesn't care if it was a drug on neurons or skin cells or blood cells. If you compare the effect of a drug treatment and a, a vehicle control on any cell type, he merged all that data and he made drug treatment profiles. And he asked how frequently could you find a drug signature that was the exact reciprocal, like the exact inverse of a disease signature. And his prediction was that if the drugs were causing genes to change in the opposite way that a disease was causing genes to change, these might mean, be new drug targets, or new drugs to target that disease. And he's already used this to find new drugs for Crohn's disease that are in clinical trials. And we asked if this strategy might work for schizophrenia too. And so uh, this paper actually came out yesterday. I, I have to update this slide. But I'm really excited to show you that we've completed our first drug screen um, in our schizophrenia patient cells. Now, full disclosure, I didn't cure schizophrenia. If I had, I would have opened with this. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a really important proof of concept that we can do this. And we can do this in small academic labs. Now, this was a big study uh, with a lot of people helping. And so I, I don't get to claim full credit for it. And all of the analysis was led by Ben Reedhead. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with Eli Lilly. So it did take a huge number of people, but what we were able to do is test 135 drugs that Joel and Ben thought might reverse schizophrenia signatures. We did this on eight classical cancer cell lines. So all drug screening really done, all of our antipsychotics came out of screening cancer cell lines. So we tested those, but we also tested neural progenitor cells from 12 patients and from 12 controls. And we wanted to know what these drugs were doing to the different cells. And the first thing that we learn, and it's not going to surprise you, is that cancer cells are different than brain cells. A and it turns out that if you screen on brain cells, you learn things that you didn't learn if you only screened on cancer cells. And so this is an example. And, oh, and then the second thing that we learned is that patient cells are different from control cells. And if you only screen on control cells, you miss things that you would have found on patient cells. And so for many drugs, the responses were mostly the same on all the cell lines, but there were drugs that had differential responses. And here I'm showing you for between the control and the patient neural cells, these drugs resulted in, in different changes. Uh, and, and the types of genes that they're differently changing are the same genes that are differentially expressed in postmortem brain. And for one of these, the genes that's differentially responding in patient versus control brain cells are also enriched for schizophrenia risk genes. And so what we've been able to show here is that it's important that you consider the cell type relevant to disease when you do a drug screen, and that you can do it based on gene expression genome-wide and, and really begin to find ways that drugs impact different people differently. Um, and so to close, 
I want to challenge all of you with one final question. And that question is, what if it was easier to prevent schizophrenia rather than treat it? Now, I know this seems like a really big question, but we already do this for some diseases. And I like to give the example of neural tube defects. I can't think of anything more severe than being born with a brain or spinal cord that didn't close. There's no pill to treat this. If you're really lucky, there's a good surgeon. But this hasn't happened in the US. Very, it's, it's been very rare since 1992, because in 1992, we started advising pregnant women to take folic acid supplements. And this has proved so effective that every single one of us is now dosed with folic acid every single day, every time you have a muffin or a piece of toast or a pancake. And so if we can prevent something as serious as a brain that didn't close with something as simple as a vitamin, I want to keep in mind that we don't always need to cure disease. It, it might prove more efficacious to prevent it. Um, and with that, the, my final slide is my most important one. Uh, it's the people in the lab who are doing all the work, all the pipetting. They're feeding the stem cells every day, all weekend long. If they weren't doing all the hard work, I'd have nothing here to share with you today. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and thank you for your time.